Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for your kind invitation to be here today. Uh, when I give a talk, I have two rules. One is if you can't hear me, you raise your hand and let me know to speak up. Usually, it's the other. The second rule is if I'm too loud or too long-winded, <laughs> it's shut up. I get that more often than the first. Ever since the Lawrenceville Historical Society has been founded in 1982, our purpose has been to document the rich history of the community. We frequently have walking tours, and on many of those walking tours, we show this site. But we only knew a little bit about the history. So this presentation was really a challenge to roll up our sleeves and go to work and see what we could come up with. So our story begins today with a man by the name of William Barclay Foster. He was a very prominent merchant who decided to get into the real estate business. So in April 1814, he purchased 123 acres of land from Alexander Hill for a consideration of $35,000. That original tract of land was much smaller than what we now know as Lawrenceville. That original tract of land was roughly from the present day 34th along Penn Avenue, along the Allegheny River, to about 42nd Street, and then it cuts an irregular line and goes along Butler Street, then down along the river to about 46, 47th Street. Okay, so what does Mr. Foster do with this land? He's a property flipper. <laughs> property flipping's nothing new in Lawrenceville. This guy invented it. He turned around and sold 30 acres of land about four days later to the federal government for purposes of an arsenal. The deal is not complete until about April 29, 1814. And the government does buy his 30 acres of land for $12,000 and they lay out an, an arsenal which we knew for many years as the Allegheny Arsenal. This military facility served our country from 1814 until 1926. On June 1st, 1814, Mr. Foster lays out a town that he calls Lawrenceville for the naval hero James Lawrence. Now, we know also that this is a very bad investment for Mr. Foster price today and Mr. Foster literally lost his shirt on buying and laying out a town called Lawrenceville. Okay. The economic depression of 1825 hit William Foster very hard. When he was unable to meet his mortgage payments, he lost most of his Lawrenceville land holdings to the Bank of the United States. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Tom to fill in a few things I missed. Uh, yeah, I just want to point out again. You're not going to be able to, you know, see the details on this map, but I'll just point out a few things uh, on it because these streets are pretty much the same as they are today. Uh, this is Butler Street right here. Uh, this is Penn Avenue, the forks of the road. No doughboy do here at that time, uh, right there, and. Uh, be you know, when he bought the property, there were some existing structures in here. There's a tavern here, uh, stables, uh, essentially the uh, uh, 19th century parking lot. And uh, also there is a stream running through uh, the property, which again, it still does today, but it's all been piped uh, underground. Uh, but it's two mile run, and that uh, starts up in, uh, uh, in uh, Squirrel Hill and works its way around uh, to the Allegheny River here. Uh, these streets, uh, again, the, the grid pattern is pretty much the same. This is a little out of scale. Uh, when the, uh, back in, in 1836, uh, the Arsenal expands all the way to meet up with Penn Avenue. Uh, but for right now, it uh, sort of ends. This is about at Government Way there. Uh, so, which is close to where we're standing now. Uh, I think we are off the map uh, here. But uh, yeah, this is what uh, the plan that uh, William Foster submitted. Oh, Wainwright's uh, grist mill down there. Uh, that is the start of what was to become Pittsburgh Brewing. Uh, it was one of the companies that formed the conglomerate, but it got a start on what used to be Wainwright's Island 
which is now part of the shoreline. In 1814, William Foster decides to donate one and one quarter acres of land for purposes of a burial ground for the soldiers that are stationed at the Allegheny Arsenal. That's the land we are on right now. Now we know that as late as 1840, that this is still being used as a cemetery by the Allegheny Arsenal personnel. I found in one of the, per, uh, the posting orders at the, from the uh, National Archives about the Allegheny Arsenal, and this was dated September 9, 1840, and it was signed by Major H.K. Craig, Commander. He issued this notice. John Penny, laborer of ordnance, died yesterday. He will be buried in the Lawrenceville Burying Ground. The officers and enlisted men of the detachment will attend the, the funeral in uniform from his late quarters. Now, while it was originally conceived that this was going to be strictly a burying ground for military personnel and laborers at the Allegheny Arsenal, the members of the community petitioned Mr. Foster to open up the grounds as a cemetery for the entire community. Foster agrees to that. We find another document, and that was signed on July 26, 1834, and it contained all the rules and regulations for the cemetery, and it also maintained how it, the cemetery was to be cared for. This particular document was signed by into law for the borough council. Remember, Lawrence was a borough at this point, and by John Sarper, who was the Burgess, and a Burgess was pretty much like the mayor. We find that the first schoolhouse, and unfortunately we do not have a picture of it, it definitely is not this building. The first bit of schoolhouse was erected between 1826 and 1829, and it was a single story frame building that measured 10 feet by 24 feet. Wow. When the people of Lawrenceville asked Mr. Foster for permission to erect this schoolhouse, on the ground, on the burial grounds, William Foster is very reluctant. But they said, not only will we use it for educational purposes, we don't have a church in Lawrenceville, so this will be a house of worship for all denominations. Mm -hmm. So what happened to that framed schoolhouse? Well, around 1850, it had long been in disuse. So this, the borough council decided to sell it for scrap lumber. Even in those days, they recycled. <laughs> and guess what? They got a whopping $5.77 wow. for the lumber. Wow. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to point out here, I, I, I put this uh, photo in as a placeholder just to show that, uh, again, there was there is a, has been a school on this spot for a long time. Um, you'll notice also that this is Washington School number two. Washington School number one is essentially where the, today it's the Trip uh, Hotel. Uh, it was Washington vocational, but there was before that building was erected. It's ni that's 1936, right? Yeah, it's 36. Uh, there was another schoolhouse there, which we can see in old pictures, the top of it, but we can't see the whole thing. Uh, watch at, at, at the time that that's built. Of course, Washington is honoring the fact that. Uh, People say that Washington uh, took his dunk in the Allegheny uh, near uh, what was Wainwright's Island. Uh, but uh, the, so at one point, uh, you know, he, his name pops up in the area. Uh, the danger changed in about 1868 when the city annexes it and does away with duplicate street names. Uh, but at the time, Willow Street used to be called Washington. Uh, and so that's that where that name carries over. We know that as soon as Allegheny Cemetery is incorporated in 1844, the Lawrenceville Bearing Ground falls into disuse almost immediately. Everybody runs to Allegheny Cemetery to be buried. <laughs> now when the, the borough of Lawrenceville is, was annexed by the city of Pittsburgh in 1868, all borough lands 
were turned over to the city of Pittsburgh. This was part of the borough lands, so that became city property. In 1881, trouble began to brew on this site. The Washington Subdistrict School Board of the City of Pittsburgh elected to use this burial ground for a new school building, which we are in today. And how they got around this was they asked the City Council of the City of Pittsburgh to give to pass an ordinance granting the school board permission to obtain this property from the city and to erect a new school building. City Council agreed and they executed the ordinance and the deed of transfer of property on December 31st, 1881. Almost immediately, the school board has workers coming to the site and they begin to dig foundations and cellars, but they didn't give any regard for the people that were buried here. And they literally began to throw bones everywhere. The disrespect for the people that were buried here aroused this bitter sentiment of many civic-minded Pittsburghers. Among them were J. Rogers Jeffrey, William D. Moore, A. M. Moreland, and Morrison Foster. These four men took the city and the school board to court, and they got an injunction to halt the construction of this school. Jeffries and the others contended that there were as many as 500 people buried here in 1881. And they also said that William B. Foster gave this land for purposes of a burial ground or cemetery and that it was not as the school board had fraudulently and, um, and uh, misrepresented as claiming that it was to be used strictly for educational purposes. So we see the city and the school board lying in court. So what else is there? <laughs> so what happens? I mean, now we're a stalemate. They can't build the school because there's an injunction. And this court case dragged on for about two and a half years before it was finally resolved. And the agreement was that all the graves that could be moved to Allegheny Cemetery, of course, you had to bear the responsibility of transferring the graves, would be moved to Allegheny Cemetery. And those that could not be, those graves would be surrounded by a fence. It was also agreed that they would place a monument on the site to honor the soldiers that are buried here. Well, that monument was erected on May 25th, 1887. It's a 12 foot shaft that you can still see on the grounds today. And it has the inscription, in honor of the American soldiers buried here, we will emulate their patriotism and protect the remains. Well, I sure hope we emulate their patriotism because we did a lousy job of protecting their remains. <laughs> now, there is good reason to believe that there are still a lot of bodies buried here. Last year, Berkeley University contacted the Lawrenceville Historical Society, and they were seeking information about a man by the name of Virgil David. Most of you never heard of Virgil David. Don't feel bad because neither did Tom or I. We had to do some research on this man. Actually, a lot of research. Turned out that he was the chief clerk at the Allegheny Arsenal. And we found that he died somewhere around 1839 or 1840, and he is buried here at the Lawrenceville Burying Ground. As far as we can tell, his grave was never moved to Allegheny Cemetery or anywhere else. Okay. We find also that the school was finally erected in 1885, and it was known as the Washington Subdistrict Number no. 2. Its name was changed in 1912 to the Stephen C. Foster School. I don't think I have this. He's one of the greatest composers of the 19th century. He wrote more than 280 songs and musical compositions. He's best known for his not only his plantation songs, but he also wrote hymns, ballads, patriotic compositions for the Union Army, 
and even wrote a campaign song for James Buchanan. I can't we get to the next slide, Tom? Uh, yeah, just about oh, want to interrupt uh, one thing here. First off, uh, again, this is a view of the, this building from the rear, and you'll notice it's, it's taken about 1914, but uh, that was before they thought of parking lots. <laughs> and just so you know, I did take the last space to <laughs> um, And again, the, even though this is about 1915 when this was taken, and again, we're not sh exactly sure about that, this is where I blew up that Washington school sign. If they re even if they renamed it, someone didn't go up there to repaint it at that, at that stage, but it, it's still a, it's a nice photo that we don't have too many of them. But uh, what, uh, is cha what changed the, the ball game is, of course, Arsenal School. Uh, the Stephen C. Foster School was discontinued in 1939, and it was closed because they did open the much more modern and uh, larger Arsenal School. And what's interesting is that in addition to the Foster School being closed, we find that there were a number of other Lawrenceville schools that were closed during this period, and they were the Springfield, Lawrence, and Bayard schools. In the mid-1990s, the Lawrenceville Historical Society conducted a series of oral histories, and one of the people they interviewed was long-term resident, the late Emily Beeser. She just lived right down the street here. And Mrs. Beeser actually went here to school, and she said, they were told they were closing the school because the building was unsafe. Then she quipped and says, here it is 55 years later and they're still using the building. <laughs> now, this is where we start getting into some muddled issues. Newspaper accounts show that by October, uh, in October and November of 1939, the Foster School is being run by the Pittsburgh Bureau of Recreation. Hmm. Now, throughout the 1940s, the city of Pittsburgh is still occupying the center. We at the Lawrenceville Historical Society were unable <laughs> to determine the relationship, if any, between the city of Pittsburgh and the Catholic Youth Association. Uh, before we go any further, I just want to po point out um, first that uh, this article here was written in the uh, spring of 1939. It tells of all the school closings, which uh, number one is uh, Stephen Foster. Then when we get to uh, November, October, November, we have these two articles in the paper. Uh, here it's talking about uh, using uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the now Lawrence Gar Garfield Center uh, which opens tomorrow in the Stephen C. Foster House here. Uh, so right now, it seems that the city remains control of the uh, building and that they turn it over to their uh, parks and recreation uh, section. Um, one uh, interesting person, which I'm going to mention when we get to the next slide, is this Marie Moody, who was the director. Of, she was actually an associate director uh, of uh, the, rec the recreation, uh, what was it? Oh, here it is. Uh, City Bureau of Recreation. She was like an associate director, but uh, again, a, a slightly more interest to the story after that. Uh, but she was organizing these, uh, you know, uh, activities for young uh, children at that time. Uh, this photo here is from 1946, but it's, it just shows the, you know, especially during holidays, uh, you know, the neighborhood kids came here for Christmas, Halloween, and is in this case. And so it was a big deal, especially in the 40s. Um, in fact, the newspapers love this place, and I don't know if a couple of newspaper photographers actually lived in the area, because they all see, always seem to go to the Lawrence, uh, uh, to the Foster Center, to get photos of kids doing activities. And this is just one of them. And we are fortunate to have a photograph of when this was a kindergarten now? Yeah, preschool. 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 And Al Borak 
is featured in the picture. I mean, yeah. you don't recognize him because he was young in those days. <laughs> but it took place right in the kitchen area. Okay, and you can see there's some playground equipment there, slides and swings. So please make sure Al gets his picture back. Now, if you look at that swing, here it is in the uh, article here from 1943. And uh, this is, uh, uh, again, an important uh, photo because we're right in the middle of the war. And it, it's the era of Rosie the Riveter. Um, all the men are off to war and the women are going into industry and doing the jobs that the men were doing. Well, what happens to the kids when mom is, uh, you know, you know, uh, working uh, in the factory? And uh, they would uh, drop them off at the foster center here for daycare. Uh, so this is what the, this article is uh, highlighting: the fact that uh, the daycare care, this center was very valuable for watching over kids while everybody was uh, busy with the war effort. Um, the uh, the other thing about the war effort, and again, if we go back to uh, this Marie Moody, uh, when the war was on in 1944, she is given uh, uh, the head job of the uh, Recreation Bureau of the city. And uh, the former head had went off to the Navy to uh, serve a term. And so she took over and she actually did a really good job. Uh, so much so that when the former director comes back in 1945 to take his job over, there was a controversy because they wanted to cut Marie's pay uh, because she was now no longer the head of the uh, uh, department. They sort of did a compromise, but uh, it wasn't long after, about 1946, uh, Marie said, uh, I've had enough of the city politics, I'm getting into medicine. So uh, since then, uh, the newspaper trail on her runs dry, yeah. but it was uh, symptomatic of the time where women, uh, whether they were performing ill or, or well in uh, jobs they took over from men, uh, were all of a sudden bumped back down to uh, uh, you know, the household chores once the, uh, the war was over. And again, you can't fault them for you know, giving a guy back his job for doing service for the country. But it was just, uh, just interesting how that worked out in some cases, and especially in Marie Mooney's case. On Sunday, May 15, 1955, in honor of the 100th anniversary of the death of William B. Foster, the community decided to have a commemorative event, and it took place right here on the grounds of the Foster Community Center. The service was started, at, before the service, there was actually a large parade that started at 46th and Butler Street, and then proceeded to come here to the grounds between Fisk and Main. The Arsenal Post of the Veterans of Foreign Wars actually sponsored the memorial service and the parade. Participants in the parade included the Allegheny County Motorcycle Police, Pittsburgh Police, Fire Department Band, VFW members, American War Veterans of World War II, Catholic War Veterans, Polish Army War Veterans, the VFW Auxiliary, and the Boy Scouts. Charles M. Halloran, who many of you may remember, headed the arrangement committee for the program. He was also the Master of Ceremonies, and speakers for that event were David A. Lawrence, Walter T. Kamick, and William McGowan. The narrative for the commemorative booklet was written by local historian and chairman for the, American, for the Americanism Committee of the Veterans of Foreign Wars, Joseph A. Borkowski. And I do want to say that Joe was my mentor. So if you think I'm screwy, blame Joe. <laughs> We should also mention here, we can date this photo, Davy Crockett out of costume. Both Jim and I had ours. Oh, I have my June team. I do want to point out on uh, uh, one of the newspapers show, uh, to, they, were, they called a couple of young girls up to pull the blanket down off the, the big sheet off the monument. 
and it covered over the little kids, and that's when they snapped the picture. My sister-in-law was actually buried under that sheet. <laughs> there are not many records relating to either the Foster Community Center or the Catholic Youth Association. According to Dennis Wazinski, Director of Archives and Record Services for the Catholic Diocese of Pittsburgh, Catholic Youth Association was founded in 1925 as a counseling service for teenage boys. Now here's where everything gets confusing. The archive records show, and these are secondary sources, their records show that CYA acquired Foster Community Center in 1938 and broadened its services to include programs for both youths and seniors, or youths and adults. Now, without primary sources, we can't verify what date is real and which one eh, might not be real. Uh, the secondary materials uh, again, a show that the Catholic, in the Catholic archives, they said that the sale was consummated on in 1938. Yet the Pittsburgh school records and the newspaper articles, as Tom pointed out, show this was still a school as late as June 1939. Then the issue becomes even more muddled because there is a reference on the historic Pittsburgh project that was compiled by the University of Pittsburgh and its Foster Community Center in 1955. So who is right? So how do we, uh, when we get these conflicting dates and conflicting issues, how do we resolve them? Well, we at the Lawrenceville Historical Society are very fortunate that we have a very avid researcher like Tom Powers. Tom found several articles showing that Foster Community Center was active starting in 1939 with providing activities for children. As previously noted, it's unclear if any relationship existed between the city of Pittsburgh and the Catholic Youth Association. Because I've said, you know, it's the Pittsburgh Bureau of Recreation that is running this facility in the 1930s, late 30s, and uh, throughout the 1940s. However, there is a possibility, and I must say this is a possibility, it's speculative, but there might have been some arrangement between, a, as a partnership, <clears throat> much earlier than 55, between CYA and the city of Pittsburgh. Again, without hard primary sources, it's really difficult to say for certain. Now, people who grew up in the neighborhood in the late 1940s through the early 70s recall that the Catholic Youth Association was open to boys and girls. Dues were very modest. There wasn't a membership requirement for use of play outdoor playground equipment. And oftentimes the children would run from outside into the buildings and participate in some of the activities that were going on here at the time. No one asked them to see a card, membership card, and no one even asked them if they were a member of CYA. Now since 1955 was the middle of the baby boom era, we find that Foster Community Center, along with the Pittsburgh Public Parks, and the Boys Club, and at that time was the Boys Club at 45th Street, uh, were the major recreational centers for Lawrenceville and the surrounding communities. In 1930, we find that William McGowan of Nova Scotia was invited to come to Pittsburgh to organize the Catholic Youth Association. This newspaper account shows McGowan and th that he was active with CYA and the Foster Community Center in 1965. So let's take a look at Foster Community Center in the 1950s and 1960s, since there are some of us that were baby boomers and uh, we spent a lot of time here at Foster Community Center. Outside, the children played basketball, wiffle ball, and in the sandbox. Outdoor equipment included a giant sliding board, swings, a huge merry-go-round, and a seesaw. 
No one was overly concerned with safety. <laughs> Matter of fact, when you went out to play and you came home and said, oh, I fell out of a three-story window, mom would say, did you get killed? Well, go back and try again. <laughs> so you want to talk about problems with safety. They had a giant merry-go-round outside, and the kids would try to push this thing running to see how fast they could get it going, and eventually somebody would go flying off. After a good cry, bruised knees, bruises and skins, uh, elbows and knees, you simply jump back on to got thrown off again. This would go on until somebody got motion sick and threw up all that security. And that shut down the ride until somebody from inside came and cleaned it up. Then we had another oversized form of entertainment, and it was called the seesaw. And I mean, this was a real seesaw, because you would ascend high in the air, and then you would come down slowly, and then you would use your feet and the scientific principles of the fulcrum to project yourself back up in the air. Well, that was okay if somebody gently lowered it. That didn't happen. The kid that got bored with it, he jumped off first, and you crashed down on your backside. Yeah. And the worst part is, you had to wait till the next time you came to Foster's Community Center to get back at them. Inside Foster's, there was basketball, dodgeball, a pool table, arts and crafts, baby doll judging contests, and board games. Now, for many years, John, did you want to add something about McDonald? Um, yeah, I think actually uh, we're going to, before we get into the next slide, I want to point out the fellow uh, over to the, uh, to my uh, right, uh, Ed Fay, who uh, we are going to talk about in a minute. But uh, one of the things that I was, uh, as I was going through Jim's script, and I got to the Ed Fay section, I looked at it and they, I, you know, I, I didn't uh, immediately make the connection, but then I noticed the, uh, here we have a guy who uh, went to Notre Dame, was coaching football locally, and it started to sound more and more familiar. And it turns out that Ed Fay was my neighbor. Oh, <laughs> and I knew him as Mr. Mr. Fay. Fay. <laughs> uh, but I didn't know what he was into, what his job was, until now. So um, Jim will expound on that, but uh, as you can see by these two pictures here, and I, I should mention, you can't get away with a picture like this nowadays. Uh, uh, kind of, almost kind of creepy, but it's uh, undoubtedly very innocent. Uh, Ed uh, it was the head of the uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade for many years, mm -hmm. and of course hobnob with uh, all kinds of people, mm -hmm. especially uh, the Roonies, mm -hmm. and uh, of course Chuck Noll here. So, Tom Forsen. Okay, we had um, the man who was assistant, then ran this facility for many years, Edward J. Fay. As Tom pointed out, he was a graduate of Notre Dame University. He was a guard on the football team. He played on the winning national championship team in 1949. During his career, he was also a social study and history teacher at O'Hara Town, I'm sorry, at uh, Hampton High School. He was an assistant football coach at Carnegie Tech University, national president of the Ancient Order of Hibernians from 1970 through 1974, and he was CEO of Foster Community Center. While he was here, uh, Mr. Fay was a gym teacher at Holy Family Elementary School, which was also located once in Lawrenceville. And as Tom said, we would be remiss if we did not point out that he organized the great American institution, or at least the great Pittsburgh institution, that we know as the St. Patrick's Day Parade. A foster community is, center is one of these organizations that keeps reinventing themselves as the need arises. Lawrenceville in the 1970s had undergone dramatic demographic changes. The baby boom era that started with the end of World War II came to an abrupt end in 1964. Uh, then there was the exodus to the suburbs. 
To illustrate the dramatic changes, just look at what happened to the boys club. I mean, uh, for many, many years, that was the great bastion, you know, that was the private castle for every boy in Lawrenceville. <laughs> And yet by 1983, the uh, membership had fallen so dramatically that they had to make it a co-ed facility. Uh, during the 1970s, Fosters continued to operate a preschool. Then for many years under the direction of Executive Director Gretchen Fay, Fosters ran a summer camp as part of the services to youth. Now, with the increase in the number of elderly, the community needed a center to address their needs. And Foster again reinvents itself as also a senior citizen center. This was a place where the seniors could meet for socializing and an array of activities. Uh, act among the activities, if you look at their brochures for that period of time, you'll find that they offer dance classes, cooking, painting, arts and crafts, bingo, plant trips, tai chi, yoga, aerobics, adult care, wood shop, and frequent parties for all occasions. That's <laughs> mouthful. Uh, access was available to take seniors to and from the center. Now, Fosters also served those who were unbound by allowing Meals on Wheels to operate out of their facilities, and they are still operating today. As part of the service to the senior members of our community, Fosters would frequently bring in nurses to take blood pressure and answer medically related questions. Fosters also sponsored a flu clinic and one of the neighborhood merchants, Jeff Wilson, would come, comes down here once a year and he administers the flu shots. It also opened, Fosters also opened its doors to other community organizations, such as the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, Rotary, and Block Watch groups. The one-time Polish classes were conducted every Saturday on this site. And even the Lawrenceville Historical Society held many of its public meetings here at the Foster Community Center. Today, Foster Community Center continues to operate as a multi-purpose facility. Its webpage shows that its program of service to the community includes infant and toddler care with the ability to accommodate over 100 babies and small children. They offer seniors affordable lunches, health and wellness, legal aid, recreational activities, and transportation. When Tom Powers and I started this project and presentation, we pointed out that these grounds were actually a donation from a man by the name of William B. Foster, founder of the community of Lawrenceville. On July 5th, 2018, a man by the name of Douglas Foster Reed, the great, great, great grandson of Stephen Foster, came to Pittsburgh for the first time. Tom, Lawrenceville Historical Society member Linda Kemmerling, and I had the great honor, Doug Reed and his wife Alicia, some of the sites that were influenced by the Foster family. We started the day with Foster experts, Dr. Dean Root and Catherine Miller Haynes at the Foster Museum at the University of Pittsburgh. Then afterwards, we took them to Allegheny Cemetery to show them the stained glass windows in the Temple of Memories building. Afterwards, we took them to the Foster plot and where we showed them the graves of William Foster, Stephen Foster, and other Foster members. Then we took them over to show them the remnants of the old Allegheny Arsenal. We took them up to 3600 and Avenue uh, that showed them uh, the marker that designates the site where the white cottage the birthplace of Stephen Foster once stood. And I do want to point out, everybody says, that's the Stephen Foster house up there. And I say, how could it be yet when it wasn't built until long after he was dead? It doesn't matter, it just was. <laughs> so the, the marker designates the place where the white cottage stood. 
Uh, then, of course, we brought the reeds here to show them the Lawrenceville burial ground with its solitary marker. And while we were here, we introduced them to CEO Mary Ann Hanarati, and she was elated to meet descendants of Stephen Foster. So she gave Mr. and Mrs. Reed a royal treatment and a floor-by-floor -floor tour of Foster Community Center. Since we started this talk with a Foster, it was only appropriate that as we near the end of this talk, we end with a visit by a Foster descendant. Now, we're going to end with a moment in history in the life of Foster Community Center, which Tom appropriately dubbed the final bell. <laughs> After more than a century of hanging in the tower, a vestige of the of school's historic past had to come down. Since it was a safety issue, the bell that summoned so many neighborhood children to classes had to come down. Spectators for the event included Mayor Luke Ravenstall, and uh, the grounds were filled with witnesses watching the historic bell being lowered from the tower. Even longtime Foster community staff member, Sister Grace Catherine, got in on the act, and she actually climbed up on the crane. <laughs> Another local resident who deserves note in this episode is the late Bob Kemmerle. As you can see by this photograph, it's not an easy task holding up that bell. <laughs> Foster Community Center is truly one organization that deserves more research. So today we hope that we've fulfilled your expectations of giving you a brief historical overview of the Community Center and its grounds. And but moreover, we hope that we put a story in your heart and fond memories in your minds. For your kindness in allowing us to be here today, we can only say thank you and may God bless all of you.